You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Find more great shows like this at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. This is another episode, a special series here on the We Are Libertarians podcast called The Path to Libertarianism, where we talk to prominent libertarians and hear how they end up in the libertarian camp. And along the way, we end up having a lot of fascinating conversations about a bunch of different uh, different topics. So make sure you go check it out on YouTube. Check it out on the podcast feed. And today, is, uh, we're, I'm really excited about this conversation because this is somebody that I've, I've uh, wanted to talk to for years. Uh, his name is Stefan Kinsella, and he is... The uh, he founded the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. He is. Let me just read his bio because the bio alone, you're just like, wow, he's done a lot here. Uh, he's the founder and executive editor of the Libertarian Papers website and founder and director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom, editorial board of Reason Papers, editorial advisory board of Molinari Review. He's uh, worked with fee and the Mises Institute and so many other uh, different we could go on and on thank you so much for joining us Stefan I appreciate it so much I'm glad to be here thank you for uh, hosting me and for having your podcast very yeah. nice and I my apologies Stefan I, I uh, we were talking off air about uh, y your name and people mess it up and Stephanie and it, which I can't imagine accidentally calling you Stephanie, but uh, so no, I, I'm never called Stephanie on accident. That's actually <laughs> wait. I get called Steffi by my buddy Steffi or Steffi baby or Steph. You know that's fine. Uh, it doesn't matter. I, I get called Steve, um, Stephon, Stephon. There was a basketball player at Louisiana uh, called. I'm from Louisiana. It's called Stephon Johnson. S T E F F O N D. One of these. Uh, you know, bastardized names, you know, whatever. You know. <laughs> well, your you said you're pretty, from... Your name's pretty phonetic, so you don't care. Chris Spangle, right? No, so, Chris. Like, yours is phonetic. You'll occasionally get that, like, is that with a K? And I'm just like, no. Yeah, that when 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 we when we had our son about 17 years ago, I, 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 I sat down and I, I, I tried to narrow down the list of names to names that or normal, only have one pronunciation, only have one spelling, or phonetic, are not that common, etc. Like, you can, like, there's only three left. There was Ryan, Ian, and Ethan. So I would <laughs> pick Ethan. I mean, there's nothing else for boys. Everything else, there's a problem with everything else. John, Jonathan, Hank, Henry, you know, all these fancy names. There's a problem with everything. Chris. <laughs> Yeah, K okay. with a K R K R I S and apology. Well, not only that, some women are named Chris, so it's like androgynous. So you know, so it's like it's hard to find the perfect name. Of course, there's other problems in life. <laughs> Men. <laughs> the name. So let's let's go you back. Deal with whatever name you have. Yeah. So we always start with you know kind of what 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 your family of origin was. You know, did you did you come from a political family? You said you you grew up in Louisiana. I mean. Where did your – like was it a political household? Well, so the funny thing is uh, – so I'm adopted. I'm from Louisiana, although I'm I'm such a Randian – not a Randian anymore really, but I'm such a curmudgeon, contrarian, like individualist. Like I hate to say I'm – I even hate to say I'm an American, right? <laughs> I even hate to say I'm a human. I'm just like a, sent, a sapient being, a sentient being like among all the others that – in the world in the universe um okay i'll i'll commit i'll, I'll say i'm an earthling okay i All happen right. to be an american but i don't like these identities that are foisted on you by accidental circumstances that you don't choose like being an american or being uh, from louisiana from like i'm i mean i'm from louisiana i was born there but i i've lived in texas and london and Pennsylvania and other states longer than I have in Louisiana. So, you know, um, I don't know. I, I guess it matters where you're from. But the funny thing is my first name. So I was adopted. And later on, I had this whole adoption story, which I'm going to write up someday uh, when I, I my birth mother found me when I was 30 years old. Hmm. And so my, my original my original name was not. So my name is Norman Stephan Kinsella. So my I have a grandfather, which is Irish. Kinsella is an Irish name, right? 
uh, I think my dad used to tell me it meant, it, think about the word Kinsella. It sounds something like whatever, but he said it means, hold on, stop a phone call. It means king of the islands. Okay, that's what he said, you know, because everyone tries to glorify their ancestry, right? Right. right. And it, it's not even my ancestry because I'm adopted, but that's what the story was. Um, but I, I looked into it later, and Kinsella in, in Gaelic means dirty head. <laughs> <laughs> or unclean head which doesn't mean a, like a physically dirty scalp it means like having you know unclean thoughts which is probably pretty accurate for me <laughs> yeah. conventional life if you're a libertarian you have unclean so Kinsella might be actually actually for, but my, my original name my original name was not Norman Stefan Kinsella it was the name I was given by my birth mother until a month or two later when I was adopted and my parents changed it, but it was Farrell Wayne Dwaron, D-O-I-R-O-N. When I met my birth mother when I was 30, she said, if you don't know how to spell Dwaron, think of it as do iron, like, like do iron, D-O-I-R-O-N, like, okay, fine, thank you. But anyway, my first name was Farrell, but uh, and she gave me this weird name on purpose because she tried to find me later and she thought she would leave these breadcrumbs for finding me later. It was a whole story. But anyway, I was just a little kid in Louisiana, rural Louisiana, and um, nice parents adopted, but that doesn't make a difference when you're adopted because you think you're normal. Um, and um, I was smart and apolitical so my family was like blue dog democrat like conservative but normal you know and so politics was never part of anything it was just i mean i heard a few rumors like when i when, when i registered to vote when i was seven when i was 18 when i registered you have to you know you get your driver's license and then you become 18 and you you get you get your first voter card and that was for me that was like 1983 or something like that. Um, I registered Democrat actually because my parents were Democrats, and I just and they said that's for the people, and the other parties for the. But they were all Republican or conservative, in in essence, right? Um, right. At that point, it was very fluid in terms of what party you were in. It was more local than it was this. Well, I just went to register to vote, and I had to declare. So I, I was a Democrat at first, but I, I've never voted Democrat in my life, um, So, which I'm proud of. Um, but um, I did vote for Reagan in 1984. My first vote as president for president was 84, Reagan's second term. But ever since then, I voted – well, I don't actually vote that much anymore, but I voted for libertarians after that. But anyway, um, uh, from my perspective now as a libertarian, and I'm into libertarianism. I'm, I'm really into it, right? But I think what happened was I was in a rural, a rural state, Louisiana. Uh, you know, everyone is in an in an environment which is not that not not that intellectual okay i mean people are just normal and then you have the dorks and the geeks and you know whatever and i was sort of ripe for ideas philosophy pyramid power ufos <laughs> you know psychic theory whatever i was i was like looking for something beyond this sort of you know sports lsu football kind of thing whatever and so in high school uh, a teacher so here's what happened and i've written this in in, in in an article which is a chapter in the walter block book on um uh, walter block has a good book on libertarians and giving their stories about how they became libertarians like why i chose liberty i forgot what the title is why i chose liberty yeah, something like that. Yeah. So, and my chapter's in there. And so I've already explained this. So, what happened for me? So, if you're asking the story, I think what happened, and at the time I didn't realize it because, you know, I realize it now, but I think I was a little kid 
a smart kid, a bullied kid. Um, and the adoption thing, the reason I mentioned that is because I think that made me be individualist in the sense of I don't care what my nationality or my genes are because I didn't even know. Mm. So I don't rest on that. I rest on whatever I accomplish, whatever. And I was smart, so that's what I accomplished, whatever, whatever you know. So, um, so when I read, so I was at a Catholic private high school in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And the librarian and I got along, and she could see that I was, you know, needing some more meat. And she said, you should read Ayn Rand, The Fountainhead. It's like 10th grade or 11th grade. Mm. And she wasn't even a Randy, and she was just some smart lady who could see something. And I think Miss, she, Miss, her name was Miss Reinhardt. I think she changed my life because I read The Fountainhead, and it blew my mind, right? as a 10th grader or 11th grader. And then I started reading everything, Anthem. And then I started reading everything else, you know, Henry Hazlitt and Milton Friedman and Rothbard and Mises and all the other stuff. Um, so I started becoming really, so from my point of view, I was a nothing. I was never a lefty. I was never a Democrat. I was really, I was never uh, a socialist. I was just some guy that came from an apolitical nothing and so I came from like the vacuum, like tabula rasa. And so to me, Rand and that stuff that she referred to in footnotes, I think is what shaped me. Um, and then it went from there. You know, in college, I I was I studied engineering, but it, in the side, I was I was reading like in the library, the Ayn Rand letters and Kant and history and sociology and philosophy and all these things and i think i was a frustrated engineer because i loved engineering and i was good at it but i like top of my class i loved it and it was a practical career but i just couldn't see being an engineer you know for me for yeah my life. let me ask you this because it seems to be a an interesting component of libertarianism that you don't see maybe in the Republican Party. You know, there's a conservative, you know, tradition and you've got Buckley and you've got uh, some of that movement. You've got some on the left, but there's something about libertarianism that once you start digging into it, you start falling down so many different rabbit holes and there's so many intellectual treats. Why do you think that is? Well, I don't. I think that's true of some people, right? And that's the people that you notice. I mean, there's lots of people that, of course, don't do that. They, they're like, like there, there are some people that I meet, and I, I'm honestly, I'm not trying to sound condescending, but they, I mean, because they will tell me this. They'll say, like, listen, I don't think I have good reading comprehension, or I, I, I just don't read books, and I can't do that. But like, they have leanings, right? Mm. But other people, um. I don't know what it is. I think it depends upon the person. There's something about – and there's something maybe messed up about it to some degree because <laughs> lots of libertarians are – you know, they're not the most product, prolific, productive people in the universe, but they're my people. They're my peeps, as I said in a recent podcast. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that for me… For me, it was the individualism of the fountainhead and and just the fact that you can learn things um, from books, right? Or from – and this was way before the internet and all this kind of stuff, right? So now everything is different. Um, I don't know. I think the libertarian phenomenon is, is interesting, and I'm always interested, like you, in people's stories about how they came to it. For me, I think I came to it because I wanted to um, – and my story I think is not typical because most libertarians that I know of and respect and admire and are friends with, they're not like – I'm not that prominent. I mean I'm not famous, but I, I've kind of carved out a niche of academic stuff in a certain field, so 
and I enjoy that and I use that and I manipulate in these waters. But lots of my friends are like a level or two, I won't say below me, but like they don't do that. They go to the conferences, we talk, we go to dinner parties, but they're just part of the milieu, but they're not doing it, right? Um, it appealed to me because I just loved learning and I, I started love I, I I loved personally the whole process of um, this whole academic process of footnoting like when you have a scholarly article where you footnote things and you're really you reference everything like that kind of thing now I know there's a bunch of bullshit about it and a lot of it's fake and a lot of it is fluff but I like that and I was kind of good at it and you have to kind of be good at it if you're a certain type of lawyer. So it's weird that my legal career, my practical career, sort of uh, complemented my, uh, my 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 hobby, you could call it, um, because I could publish an article on philosophy or legal philosophy or political philosophy or something like that. Which sounded a little bit like a normal legal law review article, and it was maybe in a law review, and it would satisfy the partners at the law firm. Oh, hey, you're doing what you should do to make your way in this way. But they're not the same. They're not the same. And uh, I think I've gotten off off track. But and I hate to talk about myself, by the way, because I'm not a great guy or anything. But I'm just. I do like – when I talk to someone who has the right interest or the right niche, like a young kid, if they want advice, sometimes they really want advice. It's rare that you find someone you can give the right advice to because it's rare to have a match right? But, uh, between someone who can give the right kind of life advice for someone. depends on where they're going, but on occasion this happens, and that's what I like to do when I can. Um, mm -hmm. So let me ask this, you know, when you're talking about that intellectual pursuit uh, and you know, what does what your information diet look like as you're as you're putting together these articles, as you're putting together, you know, a scholarly piece and footnoting and working on a on a paper or, or just even your daily reading habits when you're trying to understand and give context to the world? What, what is your your daily intellectual habit like? Well, so now it's different than in the past, of course, because of the internet and, and because of all the – so the internet distracts me. So like I think I'm way less pro productive in the last several years than I probably could have been because I'm just always obsessed. I mean I'm too into the internet, but that's a personal issue. On the other hand, there's way more information you can get. Yeah, um, I, I'm so with you. Yeah, it's harder to read than it used to be because you're like, oh. What's the serotonin? There's so, much, there's so many distractions, and everyone complains. Oh, uh, modern technology distracting people. I'm like, yeah, but that's like an embarrassment of riches. So I, I <laughs> but when I was younger, I had these weird. I was very, very, and I see this now as the older guy who looks upon my previous things. Um, I was extremely um, disciplined. Um, I would have a law job during the day and with my wife. Now, this is before I had a kid, really. <laughs> when I had a kid, things changed, like having children. So if you're just married and have a nice, successful, young, professional career, and you're – and I combined it with this intellectual life, which was writing articles and editing things. And um, I mean I when I started these law firms in Houston and then Philadelphia, you know – I the law firms were amazingly in a way generous in the sense that they would support anything you want to do that has any kind of um, uh, plausible connection towards business development, they call it, or career development, right? So some lawyers, they will do, you know, they'll take people out to dinner and they'll schmooze people and try. So you can try to get clients, right? It's called business development. But some people, they'll give speeches at the bar associations, and some will write articles for law reviews, right? They, they become like – so there's different ways you get your name out there, and of course I did the latter, and two-thirds of that was really libertarian stuff disguised as law. <laughs> yeah, but I got – so I would be at these law firms in Houston and then Philly and then back in Houston the second time. 
and we had these departments of of of, of helpers that you could, they could do whatever you wanted, and you could charge it to a non billable called a non billable account. A non billable account is a is an account that the firm will pay for, but it's not billable to a client. Mm. But they 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 let you have a certain. In fact, they encourage it because they want you to do non billable things like speaking and teaching and promoting something, right? So I was going to the Mises Institute in Auburn, and they were paying for the plane rides. I mean, like, <laughs> and I was totally honest. I never have been dishonest. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to an Austrian economics conference in Auburn, Alabama <laughs> from Philadelphia, and you guys are going to pay for the hotel and the plane fare and the fee. <clears throat> and you understand that I'm giving a talk on why we should abolish copyright law. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, fine, that's great. You guys, ha you have some, you have some get go. You have some moho. You have some, you know, you have some get up and go. You have some, you have some ambition." They didn't care. They didn't know. Um, so I did all that kind of stuff. But then I would get the librarians to go to all these libraries for me. Like every time I found a footnote in an article that seemed like a potential source of stuff I needed to learn, I would just write it down, send it to these paralegals in the in the in the department and they would go to a library and if they didn't have the local pennsylvania library or whatever they would do an interlibrary loan then they photocopy it and so i had the stack of articles i think they all thought i was crazy <laughs> but the partners didn't care because they weren't paying for it and you know supporting his research and his seat so i developed this huge arsenal of research uh it was like I mean, it's probably 20 feet long if you let it. It was like tons of legal articles, philosophy journal articles, sociology, but mostly economic, uh, mostly law review articles and chapters of books. And then I paid someone to scan it all for me. So I have it all on my computer because I went digital. But that's kind of a, for me, it's a fun part of my career. It's like I was like really vigorous in sinking my teeth into everything. And I remember I would sit at my computer. Honestly, I can hardly remember how I got on the internet because I remember we didn't have Wi-Fi at the time. You had to like plug an Ethernet cable into your computer. I mean, like you know, remember? God forbid like, you're oh, on the phone with somebody. That's I, when I was a kid. That she was on a phone call and you wanted to get on the internet to talk to your girlfriend. That was that era was rough. People don't even no, know. No, that yeah, that was earlier. I remember that too. When I, that was when I was in, in college or law school. I remember I would I would be like on the modem and like doing this kind of connection and then someone pick up the phone, they screw my connection up. Uh, no, I just mean after that, when you had a dedicated cable, it was an ethernet connection, but you didn't have Wi-Fi yet. So you had to have your computer connect. So like the whole thing is to me is a jumble. And uh, anyway, I'm rambling a little bit, but so, so uh, l l let me go back for a second because I think I've gotten even, more on a tangent, on a tangent, on a tangent. Um, basically, I loved and discovered economics and philosophy and the the liberty philosophy when I was in high school and college. And one reason I switched from engineering, not switched, but I went from engineering to law school was because I started loving this mode of thinking and it has worked out well for me in my in my personal life and my personal career but um in the same time i was developing my my contacts and my connections and my uh, my thoughts right and my writing with the mises institute and other and other seminars and things like that so all that happened for me from like say 1994 to 19 to now um so that's kind of where i've ended up and at the, at this current point in time i'm kind of quasi retired mostly retired still do some patent law but i'm still trying to write books and get the ideas out there for liberty and for understanding of property rights and free market ideas that's kind of where I am right now. So let's hop back to when you were an objectivist, because I read an article. I think it, I'll put it in the show notes. I think it was on lourockwell.com about 
you know, going from an objectivist to an anarcho-capitalist. And many right. of our listeners may not know what the two of those things even are, okay. the distinction, because I think people look at it and they go, oh, Ayn Rand's a libertarian, Murray Rothbard's right. a libertarian. It's all the same thing. What is the distinction between the two and what, what made you transition from one to another? Okay, so I'll give my – okay, and again, I, I, I hate to talk about myself because I, I – but okay, here's my here's my own perspective on it and my own history, um, and my take on it given what I've been through. Um, the way I look at it right now is that libertarianism, which is part of my identity, okay, is it is a broad movement, and we can be gracious and include minarchists in that. Now I'm an anarchist libertarian now. And I don't think minarchist libertarians are true libertarians. I think they're flawed. But still, I think that according to the definition, they're part of our umbrella. Okay. And I think what happened was Ayn Rand, who's a minarchist in a sense. And, um, and can you explain that term for those who don't know? Okay. So the way I look at this, and a lot of way, the way a lot of libertarians look at it, is uh, there's two types of libertarians: anarchists and minarchists. So there's people, libertarians, that believe in radically limited government and state functions, and those that believe that everything the state does is illegitimate, right? So that's anarchists. And the minarchists would be the mi the minimal state advocates, and those are people like Robert Nozick or Ayn Rand, although she wouldn't use that word. Um, and then on the outside edge of that would be the classical liberals like – Milton Friedman and I won't say Ronald Reagan, but you know, like people that believe in limited government, but not really ultra. I mean, if you read Robert Nozick, I mean, uh, yeah, Nozick's uh, Anarchy State and Utopia, you'll see all these terms like uh, uh, minimal state, night watchman state. There's all these synonyms people use. But the point is, the libertarian movement comprises at the Current point in time, I believe, people that are anarchist, in other words, people that believe in individual rights to such a consistent extent that they think that the state itself or government itself is always a criminal enterprise, which is my belief, by the way. Or people that think that, well, like they believe in the Constitution and the founding fathers and the American ideal or something like that, right? Some very, very small state, they'll call it, right? But the state needs to be there for some purposes. Those We call those minarchists, right? So, of course, in the libertarian movement, there's those differences. So when, when I started out, I was a nothing. I wasn't a lefty who became right or vice versa. Like like my, my greatest uh, uh, mentor would be, say, Hoppe, Hans Hermann Hoppe. And he was a lefty because he was born in 1949 in Germany. His birthday was two days ago, September 2nd. So happy birthday, Hans. Um, but he, you know, he was a lefty at first, and then he became a Rothbardian, Mazesian libertarian. I came from nothing. I came from like really tabula rasa. Um, but. So I came from Tabula Rasa, and I was I started being interested by Rand, which she's a what you might call a minarchist. So I thought, okay, you need a government, and the libertarians are evil because they don't have a philosophy. You know, I I bought into all the Rand crap for about eight months or whatever it takes to grow out of that stuff. You know, and so um, <laughs> just to be honest, and I still admire a lot of what Rand did, um, but. Um, um, so, but then I read Rothbard and Hazlitt and Bastiat and Molinari and lots of other people. And I, I realized, oh, oh, and the Tannehills, well, the market for liberty about the Tannehills, you know, like, I'm like, actually, I'm a libertarian and actually I'm an anarchist, you know? So that's how it happened for me in my personal, like, development, um, but it all seemed natural to me. It just seemed like, oh, I just – every mistake that I'm – like there's, there's a few things I've, I've 
renounced in my previous views, which we've probably all done. But every time it's been something where I just took the word for some for some guru of some guru, like someone who yeah. said this, like Iron Man said, libertarians are evil. So she had taught me so much. I thought, OK, she she must be right. So for a year or two at LSU, I would I, I, I remember in 1984 at LSU, I was at I was Louisiana State University in the beginning. So I went to LSU. Double E degree guy. Then I went to law school there, but I was an engineer. And in 1980, maybe it's 88. Ron Paul was running for president, and Ron Paul came through campus. And Ron Paul had a, a little talk sponsored by the LSU Libertarian Party guys or whatever. Um, and I went to it because I was sorting. I was trying to get interested in this stuff. And I remember I sat in the room. I bet this was 88. And um, yeah, this must be 88 when he ran. Yeah, that's when he ran for for the LP. So he was in a classroom at LSU, and I went in there, and I was kind of like still under the Randian sway. And I was really heavily, heavily pro abortion at this point. Like, and I had some sense, and, and I think the Libertarian Party. Generally, is pro-choice like Rand would be, but Ron Paul was a slight exception because, <clears throat> you know, everyone's got their deviations or whatever. But you could tell, like, if that's your if that's your issue, abortion, which it wasn't my issue, but I noticed it. Like, they say things that, like, you could say, wait a minute. So, like, do you really agree with the with the libertarian party platform view on abortion because it doesn't sound like you do mm. so i was in the classroom and i was hostile to the libertarian party because rand had excoriated libertarians as being enemies of reason and all this kind of stuff like i totally i think i'm at this point i think i'm totally wrong i, I mean she was totally wrong they were basically the offshoot of her political, the political part of philosophy. She just didn't like competition. Yeah, you, why you, you're hitting on a couple of things that I I totally agree with because I remember at one point, you know, several probably a decade ago, you know, new libertarian. We're always they're, they're always the most zealous. You know, think yeah. I know, think I know everything. Still kind of yeah. you know under that cult of personality vibe where it's like I think this because these people say this thing or that person says this. You know, and, and Mary Ruart looked at me at a, and kind of embarrassed me in front of the room, rightfully so, by saying, like, I've been around longer than you. I'm on the train. Right. If there's a train, you just hopped on and I'm way further ahead down that road. And and as you become the longer you go, the more you understand individualism, you start to think for yourself, you start to peel these little pieces of other people's opinions away and start to examine things. I think right. that's really, you know, and that that's we're in an era of the cult of personality, which kind of highlights this and makes individualists crazy sometimes. But I think, I think you've hit on that. that and that's something that new libertarians ought to understand is that just be open-minded because you may not think what you think a decade from now. Right. And so, so Ron Paul was in the room and I, I raised my hands and I said, I, I was trying to like, I was just trying to get clarity. Like, because I was like strongly pro-abortion at the time. Like I was like Randian, like – like I'm thinking like maybe Rand is right that these libertarians are – they're not objectivist because they're not for the right – you know, the right to choose uh, or whatever you want to call it, pro-choice. And and I, I could – I noticed that Ron Paul was evading – or avoiding the issue, which he was. I think he was because he was – that's not his primary issue. It was the Fed or whatever, you know, or spending. Right. Um, and, but I, I, I was suspicious. To me, I was like – I was like – I was trying to figure out whether Ram was right. So I raised my hand, and I talked to Ron, and I was like, what exactly is your view on abortion? Something like that, you know? Like I'm trying to like nail him down. Not a gotcha, but just trying to figure out. And he gave this mealy mouth Ron Paul type response, right? Which you would expect. And I just shut up as a student and went away. 
But after that, I became pretty much a libertarian because I started thinking like, oh my god, this is the libertarian – the libertarian party is basically – not the party, but the libertarian philosophy is the capitalism or the political philosophy wing of objectivism. They just don't want to admit that, right? So I totally disag started disagreeing with Peter Schwartz and all these crazy objectivists who hated libertarians, right? Um, and became a libertarian, and then I became an anarchist after reading more and more. I mean, you know the you know the old joke like what's the what's the difference between a minarchist and an anarchist is six months. Yeah, <laughs> something like that, uh, and that was basically the case for me so i i kind of was like introduced to objectivism and libertarianism as a high school say junior in 1982 and by 1988 or so when i was getting out of law school or in in law school i basically was becoming an anarchist and i've been that Ever since, and the whole time I was reading Austrian economics, which I think is a big part of it. So that was my progression. Uh, but to me, it's not interesting. What's 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 le what's less interesting is the the progression of ideas, but how you integrate it with your life, right? Mm -hmm. and like for me, I I kind of integrate it with my life by because I had a law career. And I could publish articles that would count for prominence and client development. So you could blend these things. So I tried to do a careful balancing act of all this kind of stuff. And then at the same time, so this is around, say, 1988, 89, 90. Then I became a lawyer in 1992, started practicing, became a patent lawyer in 1993, 94. And at the same time, I started becoming heavily opposed to the patent and the copyright system because of my thinking and research into these issues. At the same time that I was taking the patent bar and becoming a, a licensed patent lawyer, and I'm I'm just a young lawyer at big law firms, and you know, I'm thinking, how do I divide these things up, like? How do I split these these interests apart? How do I segregate them so that I don't get in trouble? <laughs> yeah. But then I realize after a certain point, I mean, five, two, three, five, ten years later, you realize no one cares. I mean, right? <laughs> I, like, there's I, I mean, surprisingly, there's total freedom of I want to say freedom of speech, but whatever you call it, but. No one cares if you're a good hotshot lawyer at a big law firm and you know your shit. No one cares what your personal. It's like no one cares what your sexual preference or your or your religion is. They don't really care. They really don't. Which is one good thing about the West, I think. They really don't. And likewise, they don't care what your personal opinion is about what the patent law should be like. They just want to know that you can do the law and you can represent their case and you understand it. And in fact, if you stand up and you may have a loud opinion opposing the system, lots of people think you know your shit. <laughs> they assume that, oh, I mean, I can't tell you how many times in the last 20 years I've gotten calls from people, some libertarians, some not. Hey, Mr. Kinsella. I really like your anti-patent law stuff. I've got an idea for a new invention. Could you help me do it? Like It's like switch, switch, switch. But the reason is because they – well, they're libertarians, number one. So they, they think they need a libertarian lawyer, which they're wrong about. But <laughs> they see that they know someone they trust, and they know is not evil, and who knows his shit. Yeah. And they know that if I want if they want a patent and I can get a patent for them, I know how to do it. It doesn't matter that I disagree with the system. Like if you criticize the system, it, m it means you must know the system. How to navigate the system. You at least have an interest in ascertaining how the system works 
And this is one thing that I was curious about because you went to school to be an engineer and you ended up a lawyer. And before, because I want to dive into patent law and spend a lot more time on copyright and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, briefly, is there an overlap between, you know, the engineering systems and that systematic way of thinking and the law in general? Is, it, it, was it a natural kind of click between the two, the, the way that your brain worked in that engineering well, mode into the law? I mean, uh, I can only speak for myself. But of course, I only am. I hate these disclaimers people do when they say, I'm only speaking for myself. I'm like, yeah, who else would you be speaking for? Um, but to say that, what I'm saying is maybe other engineers or lawyers might not agree. But my, my take is this. Um, well, first of all, there's a misconception. So you you said something I've heard many times over the years, Okay, which is, why did you switch? Now, most people don't understand that. Like, so let, let's just take the the Ameri Let's just take the U.S. the American case. In the U.S. since 1960 or 50 or whatever, um, the law degree has been a second degree, a JD, not an LLB. It used to be an LLB, a first degree, like it still is in England and some other countries. But now it's a doctorate or a graduate degree, like a medical degree. Yeah. Which means that to get a to get a, to be a lawyer in the U.S., you have to get a JD. To get a JD, you have to have a first degree, a bachelor's of something, English, history, philosophy, or even engineering. So there's no connection between them, but it is a second degree, right? You follow me? Yeah, so, no, yeah, no. That makes sense, and that makes sense that you would you'd understand technical systems and then go into something like patent. Well. Or Right. Yeah. Well, so to be a patent lawyer, uh, the way it works is you have so to be a lawyer, you have to be licensed to practice in a state. So most lawyers have they'll say, well, every, pretty much every lawyer will say, yeah, I'm licensed in Texas or California or Louisiana or whatever. Um, and to be a patent lawyer, you have to have the patent bar. So you have to take a bar, what they call a bar exam. By the way, do you know why the way the reason the way they use the word bar? Isn't it from the barristers in England? It, it, I know it's from England, but I don't remember the origin story. Well, so like if you think of a courtroom, like you imagine there's a section of the courtroom geographically or physically spaced out. You know, you have the, the judge, and then you have a section for the jury, and then a section for the spectators, and a section for the lawyers. And then there's like physically like a little pivoting post that you have to go through to get into this one chamber near the judge that's called the bar mm. so like to pass the bar like literally means you have the right to pass that bar uh, you know, I, I love etymology and crazy crap like this because i'm an engineer and i i, I resent <laughs> what i didn't study in but anyway my point was most people think that when you go from engineering to law, it's a switch, but it's not a switch because in America today, to be a lawyer, you have to have some first degree, some four-year bachelor's degree, a BA or a BS in something. It doesn't matter what it is. Like there's no – like when I, when I thought about going to law school, like I was a fourth-year engineering student or maybe a grad student in, in – and I got my master's in engineering too. Uh, maybe I was a grad student. My wife, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Do you want to hear personal stories? Or, I mean, what do you want to hear? Because I don't want to go, because I'll, I'll tell you like an interesting anecdote. Okay. Well, I was, go ahead. I was at my wife's, my my current wife's, my then girlfriend's house. At her, her father was a chemical engineer, manager of a chemical plant. Very smart guy. Having dinner with them, I was a, a grad student in electrical engineering, getting my master's in electrical engineering. And and I did that because I didn't want to leave. I got my first offer from General Dynamics to work on these jets, and I didn't want to leave my girlfriend who was going to be in school for a while, all that kind of stuff. So I just said, I'll just get a master's degree, see what happens. This is like 1980, 80, 88. Um, and 
my wife's father says something like, um, well, my, no, my wife, my wife, she was very ambitious. She, she's very smart, but she wasn't hyper smart like me. So she thought I was going to be the millionaire. My wife turns out to be the one that makes all the money in the family. But anyway, <laughs> that's the way it goes. Ambition exceeds IQ, put it that way. <laughs> yeah. um, but anyway, so my wife, we're sitting at the dinner table and my wife says, Stefan, you're really smart. Why don't you go to medical school? Oh, oh, I remember what happened. Her father had just come back from his high school reunion in Florida where he met one of his old classmates. He was from Pennsylvania, and he met one of his classmates who was like a doctor that worked on um, the knees of these athletes in Florida. And he was making like $350,000 a year. And this is back in 1988. That's a lot of money back then. Yeah. And he was working like two or three days a week just doing knee surgery on athletes. <laughs> you know, there's these specialties that you can make a lot of money, and there's others that can make even more, right, in medicine. And my wife says, I mean, my girlfriend says, Stefan, you're smart. Why don't you go to medical school? I said, well, I don't really like biology, and I don't. I don't know if I have the prerequisites to go to medical school, or it would take a lot longer. And she goes, huh, what else could you do if you're smart and make a lot of money, more than an engineer? I said, I don't know. She goes, well, you like to argue with people. What about being a lawyer? I said, <laughs> so I said, I don't know. I said, I don't think that I – th I think you have to have a pre-law degree. This is what inspired this anecdote because I, I, I was so naive. I thought you had to. I thought you had to have a pre-law degree to go to law school. Right. But it's not. You have to have a. You have to have an undergraduate degree, but it doesn't matter what it is. So I. I kind of said something like. Um, I said, I don't know. I don't know if I'm smart. I don't know if I have enough intelligence or education to go to law school because I was intimidated by it. And her her father started laughing because he. He was a uh, he was a plant manager for a plant and smart, and he had been around lawyers. And he started laughing, like he's like, "Dude, lawyers are not that smart." I'm like, oh. <laughs> "He says you're he said you're a double E. Trust me, it's double E is way harder than law school. If if you want to do law school, you can do it, but don't think that it's too hard." So the next the next day, I walked across the campus at LSU, and I went to the LSU Law School, which I'd never been to, and I went. I made an appointment with the chancellor and I said, can I go to law school? Do I need to get like a, a pre-law degree? He said, no, you're all right. You can do it. He goes, however, engineers have a tough time in law school, <laughs> which is total bullshit. I turned out, it turns out, I mean, he said that to me and I'm like, okay. So I took the LSAT, I scored well and I went to law school. That's what happened. But he was totally wrong. I think like, most engineers that I know did well in law school, and here's the reason. Engineering is analytical. I'm sorry. It is, it is, it is quantitative. However, it's analytical. It's problem solving. Like the goal of engineering is to solve a problem, like to figure out what the answer to the problem is. And the same thing is true in law except it's verbal and it's qualitative, not quantitative. But the goal is the same. It's problem solving. So you have these English majors, let's say, who go to law school. They never learned problem solving. They were never analytical. You know, They're analyzing a text and giving some kind of woo-woo analysis of a text, which no one can ever judge is right or wrong. It's not a problem solving issue. Right. So the engineers, they might have been a little bit um, – some of the engineers who go to law school might be a little bit um, um, behind because a lot of engineers are not good at communication, like writing and communicating. They're, they're, but that's kind of a symptom of some engineers. But they're not all that stupid. Like some people can actually communicate, and you learn to write a letter or an email. It's not that hard, or a paper. It's like um, a space. I, I I talk to the public for the engineers. They can't. I'm in between. 
Um, yeah. But but if you have an engineer who knows how to communicate, I don't think law schools honestly is not that hard. I mean, compared to engineering, it, um, so that was my story about. And I I love law school by the way. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I, most of my classmates hated it. So I was always amazed that they were hating it. But I was loving everything about it because to me it was like I was being. I loved engineering too, but I I was like I was being released from the strictures of 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 of, of mathematics and calculations. We could talk in human terms about real problems. You know what I mean, like in verbal yeah. terms. So I loved it all. I loved all of it. I loved all my nine years of college. So I'm one of these people that's weird. I, I just loved college. Yeah, I do too. I uh, actually just. This is my first semester back since 2005 to finish my degree. And I think because I thought back and I was like, I really loved the process of learning. I love doing this show because it's, you know, it's a research paper every week. Um, but I, w I would be remiss. So I work in radio now and I've worked in the, the creative industry my whole career. And I think like most people who kind of work in my field or, or at, in the public, you sort of go, well, you know, I don't want anybody to steal my work, you know, and I, I saw you wrote an article that I'll put in the show notes titled Do Patents and Copyrights Undermine Private Property, which I thought was an interesting title because I think of we are libertarians as my property, right? Like if you somebody tried to steal the name and start a Facebook page like mm. five years ago and. You know, and I, obviously people would realize that this was the thing that was started 10 years ago. And so you have the social proof, whereas the other other people wouldn't. But you sort of go, hey, what are you doing? You know, so I think that that idea of I created this thing, I'm putting it out there. This is my brand. But then I also recognize that's all kind of amorphous. And really what I do is just listen a lot, read a lot, take in a lot of things. You know, there's there's nothing new under the sun necessarily about, you know, it's all the same chords if you're playing music i mean what is it not private property what protection should a person have in terms of copyright how would it work in a free market system just give me like the basics of it and we'll start there i think mm. is that too broad of a question no it's just that i've i've dealt with this question probably literally a thousand times and I'm always trying to think of like what's the best um, and it depends on the audience too but um, so I, I remember Jeff Tucker who you probably know or know of mm -hmm. yep. um, good, a good old buddy of mine from the old days he was telling I mean Jeff Tucker so w w when I started thinking i started thinking hard about the ip stuff intellectual property patent copyright that kind of stuff the stuff you're mentioning but you're also mentioning by the way you might not know it but you're mentioning related things like trademark and plagiarism like all kinds of, and fraud things that are all not the same thing but that's what that's what happens people mix them together um i started thinking about this because i was always uncomfortable um as a budding libertarian thinker like a guy reading from the outside like starting in college i was always uncomfortable with rand's argument for patent and copyright something about it like i'm like this like i i assume she was correct because she was she is genius and everyone else is in favor of patent and copyright and it's part of the american western capitalist system so it's got to be right but the arguments just don't quite make sense, right? Like, Which are let's summarized sort of like, you know, I put my labor, I mix my labor and time and materials and, you know, skill set all into this one thing. And then, you know, I should have some ownership over that. Something like that. That's the argument for it. But then the, but what they're arguing for was a system that would be like a limited set of rights that would extend to some things, but not others by legislation. Like like it would extend to like maps and paintings, but not databases. 
and it would extend to uh, machines and airplanes and the light bulb and the transistor, but not to E equals MC squared. And they would expire after a certain point in time, like 17 years or in the case of copyright, 14 years, then 28, then 58, and, and now 100 and whatever. But the point is, it's like everything about it was arbitrary. It's like, why would they expire after a certain point in time? How do you know what that should be? And why are some things covered and some things not? So something about it didn't make sense to me, right? So I thought something is wrong with this. And I just, you know, I, I'm a nobody. I'm just, I'm just some libertarian law student who is listening and reading and thinking. But then I became a lawyer and I started writing and publishing and and then I became an IP lawyer itself, a patent lawyer, a registered patent attorney. So I actually, like I actually understand how patent law works now and copyright and trademark and all these things. And I'm thinking like I, I need to figure this shit out because it's not a moral issue like I'm enforcing it and working in it. I need to like know whether I should do it or not, although mm -hmm. that might have been part of it. It was more like I'm the only guy that can do it. I mean, I'm not saying I'm the only guy who can do it, but like, who else is going to do it? So people criticize me sometimes for being a hypocrite. Like, oh, you're a patent lawyer, and then you're against the patent system. I'm like, well, let's let's assume the patent system is illegitimate. Who do you think is going to realize that and be able to explain it and figure it out other than someone who actually understands the system? Who and that can probably is going to be a practitioner. Who's an expert like I like I am and was I mean so so ar around the same time I started like getting my law to, my 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 bar my bar my bars passed and practicing law getting my patent bar learning about it I started think I started reading more and more and more and more and more about IP law uh, issues and. I was determined to figure it out. I thought like, okay, all these other guys have bad, bad arguments. Ayn Rand has a bad argument for it. You know, Coase, whoever has a bad argument for it. But I will find the right argument. I will solve the IP issue. I will be the one that will solve – I will explain to people why we need patent law and copyright law and why it's okay. And – but the more I looked into it, I kept uh, you know, butting my head against the wall and failing, and it's not because I'm stupid. I'm still pretty sure about that. That, that wasn't the problem. Um, I might be stupid, but that wasn't the reason. But the reason was because I was trying to prove the impossible. It's like I was trying to prove two plus two is five. I was trying to do that, and I tried a million different ways. And I finally realized, oh, here's why you can't prove 2 plus 2 is 5, because it's not. <laughs> I finally realized I had an epiphany, like, oh, I've been trying to prove something that is basically unjust like the whole time. So I came to a realization right around the same time that I passed the patent bar and started doing it. Like the whole thing was total bullshit and unjust. So then my question was like, what do I do? Like, can I announce this? Will this hurt my career? You know. And so I kind of tepidly put my foot in the water. I did one or two talks, and I'd be like, well, here's one argument for, here's one argument against. You know, thinking like if there's a big backlash, I can kind of like back off. But there were never was a backlash because no one. The only people that care are libertarians, really, or <laughs> people that are victims of it. The lawyers don't care. Your clients don't care. As I said, being against IP has gotten me clients in the past. So, because uh, to them it's a it's a, it's a signature that it's a, it's a, it's a guarantee that you you know your stuff. Well, it's also like you said that intellectual courage to say out loud what you truly believe, knowing that it may there may be some consequences to it. If you're willing to be an IP lawyer that says all of this is bullshit, there is some some courage there, and I imagine that's attractive. I mean, that's 
That's I think it's not, it's not just that. It's that if you have the credentials that I had, which was, you know, big firms and whatever, then they know that you're not like just trying to spout off. Like they know that you must know what you're talking about. You must have enough courage of your convictions to know what you're talking about. So all they care about is it's a sort of it's a certification that you're an expert, basically. I think. I don't know. Um, I haven't interviewed all these people that are contacting me, but anyway, I found it an interesting process. Um, I forgot where we're going with all this, but well, I, I I found the whole thing pro uh, interesting. Yeah. So, what was the solution? What is the solution? I mean, if you're if you oh. write a piece of music, if you if you write a book, like how 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 do you maintain rights without everybody just ripping you off and stealing your stuff? Yeah. So, I mean, I I like literally did like a seven, eight, nine hour Mises course on this about ten years ago because it takes a long time to unpack all this because everything you just said is like a presupposition that i think is wrong um like just using the word stealing um or or even the presupposition of saying how do i do this how do i make sure i make money like the the purpose of political philosophy and philosophers they're 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 not bound to tell entrepreneurs how they can make a profit in a world where competition is possible that's the job of entrepreneurs right like number one so if you say how can i how can i be a poet and make money off poetry it's like okay that's interesting that's a question but a question is not an argument so that's one of the first things i think you have to recognize questions are not arguments so if you just bark out at someone, how am I supposed to make money uh, selling my new light bulb idea if I don't have patents? If you just bark that out, I don't really know if that's an honest, sincere, genuine question um, because it's it's basically a way of saying it's it's sort of like when 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 socialists or welfare advocates say something like um okay you you libertarians say that in a free market uh there'd be very little poverty and what little poverty there is remaining would be handled by charity show me proof of that right it's fear based it, well it's it's what they want they want a guarantee they want you to guarantee that like some poor fireman's daughter who's killed in an accident is going to be able to go to college. And if you can't guarantee that, then they're going to say, fine, fuck you. I'm going to take the, the medical – the welfare state. It's like, well, but – because if, once you start saying that calm down, everyone simmer down, if we get rid of Medicare, Medicaid, and the welfare state – and we get rid of public schools and private and public libraries. There will be private libraries and private schools, and the Catholic Church will come in. <clears throat> if you kind of give them these ideas about what a free society might look like, <clears throat> what they will do is they'll say, give me a goddamn guarantee. <laughs> and if you can't give them a guarantee, they'll say, fine. Then I'm going to keep taxing you, and I'm going to make it my guarantee. And of course, our answer would be, <coughs> excuse me, well, what's your guarantee? I mean, because you know, the government's probably going to be bankrupt and run out of money, and the, and there might be a revolution, and Medicare, Medicaid, yeah, you know, like you don't have a guarantee either. So it's all bullshit. One of the better everyone wants a guarantee. There's no guarantees in life. Yeah, that and the the turnaround of that is always it's already happening in society. We have all this government. And we have all of these, you know, supposed guarantees because of the law, and yet the bad actor still exists. Well, it's and so, so take, more. Take copy, so take the copyright or patent case. People have these false assumptions about the way copyright and patent work. Like they think that, like, well, if you don't have copyright and patent, I like doing a hick accent to like make fun of them, you know. But uh, 
how, what's going to make sure that I'm going to get paid for my screenplay or my invention? The little guy need. It's like, well, first of all, the patent and copyright system don't guarantee that anyway. All they do is give you a legal right to go to court if you can afford the lawyers to stop someone from competing with you. Now, I will concede that that gives you an advantage in the free in the market because it converts a free market to a, monop a monopolized or monopolized market, right? Where probably monopolized, where like you're the only seller of this good. But even that doesn't guarantee anyone wants to buy your shit. You know, if Apple has a monopoly on a rounded corner iPhone, that does give them an advantage because no one can compete with them. But it still doesn't guarantee them an income because if no one wants to buy that, they're not going to buy it. They wouldn't have bought that in 1972 because it wouldn't have worked. You know what I mean? It's like – so. The patent and copyright system don't guarantee money to anyone. It just helps them repress competition. So that's the essential thing people need to understand about IP is that patent and copyright law are basically totally contrary and counter to private property rights, individual liberty, free markets, competition… Innovation, dynamism, modernism, <laughs> that any modern liberal or libertarian thinker ought to be in favor of. So you got to stop and think about that. So if a little girl goes – so the reason I brought up Jeff Tucker, like my friend Jeff Tucker thought I was crazy when I wrote this IP stuff a long time ago. And then he read it, and he thought, oh, Kinsella's is right. So he and I became like – Which is funny because Jeffrey Tucker in – when Jeffrey Tucker was on the show in 2013, he's the reason we have uh, Creative Commons on our website because Tucker was the one who, in 2013, was like, don't put all rights reserved on there. What are you doing? You're libertarians. And, and he explained some of this stuff to right. us. It's funny. <clears throat> right, and that was in the aftermath of all this kind of stuff. But he gave me this example, like his little – one of his little girls like, like went to school, and she had like come up with a new hairdo or something, like the way she tied her hair. And it was kind of cool, and all the kids liked it. And then she went to school the next day, and another girl had the same thing. And she came home crying to daddy, like, this girl stole my haircut. <laughs> so it's like, it was like a little micro example of this IP mentality. Now, of course, the other girl didn't steal anything. She emulated her. She learned. She copied, right? Like I, I, I'm, I probably have the example mangled, but it was something like that. So, but the point is, when you say if a new business crops up or someone does something and they steal my idea, they're actually not stealing it. That's the word we use, and we we use that word because it has negative connotations. Because stealing, actual stealing, is actually bad. Like, like raping is bad. Which is why date the word date rape has become you know like the whole thing like people they glom onto things that have an it's like equivocation. So I guess my point is if someone copies you, competes with you, emulates you, learns from you, they're not stealing because they didn't take anything that you own. And if you say that they you own the way you're doing business or whatever, then you're begging the question because the question is. What is ownership? Do you really own that? So, yeah, and I think the internet provides a great example of uh, people have a very uh, closed fisted view of the world. Oftentimes, they kind of think, I, I need to keep, but there's only so much pie. You know, if, if you take this piece of the pie, then I'm going to lose this piece, as opposed to an ever expanding. Um, I actually just reread um, Leonard Reed's uh, eye pencil, you know, talking about mm -hmm. there is no central planner for the pencil. It's over the long period of time mm -hmm. it's developed into the pencil. And you have all these various people collaborating to make the pencil to perfect it over time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the Internet gives so many great examples of 
you know, things like this where I can, I can start up something, build an audience. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've made a few successes. You know, I'm learning, I'm getting better. I'm, you know, putting in reps, I'm helping other people, you know, uh, build, build their podcast, that sort of thing. You know, you, it's a very, it's much more of an open mindset and the less regulation, the less control there is on the internet. It, it shows you how much growth and how much opportunity. And of course there's, there's problems with something, but the, the internet, I think really kind of highlights the ideas that you're talking about and shows innovation can be a powerful tool. You know, once you get out of the way of it and stop letting people protect it. Am I, so, am I on target there? I don't disagree with anything you just said, uh, but what you just made me think of was something that's maybe a little bit, um, I mean, I, I admit that when I talk and what we just talked about, I'm a little bit abstruse sometimes and I, um, but you know, if someone's interested in ideas and they want to think about it, uh, that's fine. Um, but I, I mean, how much, how much, are you or your audience into the the basic the basic ideas of say Austrian theory, Austrian economics theory? I would say interested. Probably, you know, we, we don't talk a lot about it here because we talk more issues, but I, you know, we're interested. Yes. Okay, because I think that the way to really understand this is so Mises, Ludwig von Mises, who I think is probably one of the greatest thinkers, certainly the greatest economists, but maybe one of the greatest thinkers of the 20th century. Um, he His basic way of looking at things. Now, I'm going to introduce a word which will sound off-putting to people. Like a lot of these coined terms did to me when I learned them when I was younger. But over time, you learn that some of them make sense. And his word was praxeology. Okay, so forget about the word, but that's the the word he used to describe his thinking about economics and what economics is and how to understand human action and what humans do, right? Economic activity, and all it meant was the logic of human action. And really, all that means to me, and I'm going to focus on. It means that you 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 have to, we're all human actors. Every person has a body, and we're an actor in this world of scarce resources. We all have a limited time on the earth, and we try to ach achieve successive goals over time, right? Which means that we don't know what the future is. We don't know what's coming. The future is uncertain, but. We have a general awareness of what the situation is like and what it might be, what we need to do to intervene in the state of affairs to achieve our goals. This is what human action is. This is what economics is about. It's about analyzing the consequences of this general structure of human action. So basically human action is the, the fact that people – have bodies, and they employ scarce resources to achieve goals in the future. So, I mean, people don't think like this. Like, they think if I want to kiss my daughter, I want to kiss my daughter. You know, if I want to make a meal, I make a meal. But really, everything is time oriented, everything is aimed at the future. So, like, as Mises calls it, you have felt uneasiness. Like, you have some idea about what's happening. In the next five minutes, the next two minutes, the next 10 minutes, the next year, and you envision that if you don't intervene or do something, what's going to happen is not going to be what you want. Like if you don't intervene in the next 10 minutes, you won't have a cheese sandwich to eat, and your hunger will become insatiable, whatever, right? So you take an action, and so this is the general structure of what humans do, but the general structure – which Mises calls praxeology. So forget about the word. It's a Greek word. It's a Greek. It's a Greek informed coinage, but it means the logic of human action. But what it means is that every time we human beings do something, that we act, <clears throat> we control our bodies 
to manipulate things that are within our possession, right? And we do that to achieve something in the future. We're trying to change the future. We're trying to create a new future, to be honest, right? We're trying to make a future exist that won't exist without our without our intervention, right? So the whole purpose of human life, not the purpose of human life, but what human beings do is that they have purposes that they try to fulfill by, by acting, by manipulating resources. Now, the thing about this that is underemphasized, I believe, in economics is the knowledge aspect because to be an actor, to be a human being that acts, yeah, you have to have the – you can't be Stephen Hawking in a wheelchair who can't do anything. You have to have the ability to control your body and therefore some other resources in the world to extend yourself into the world, right? which is a whole other discussion, the property rights discussion. But you also have to be knowledge. You have to have knowledge. So there's two things. So this simplistic, I think it's simplistic or simple understanding of the way of of our relationship as human actors to the universe leads you to realize that number one, we have to have control or possession or use of resources. But you also have to have knowledge or information because you can't you can't use something to make a fire if you don't know that that can make a fire. So you need knowledge, and you need the things that can make the fire. So you need access to the things. So property rights control one. They control the things that we need to access and use and manipulate. But we also need knowledge. Now, once you understand human action and human society in this fashion, I think it helps to – well, this is my view. Human progress has come about because primarily of the increase of knowledge over time, especially in the last 200-plus years of the Industrial Revolution. We finally reached a tipping point. Where all this scientific technological knowledge has compounded on itself, and everyone has more and more knowledge of ways to causally manipulate the things, the scarce things in the world, in the universe, right, to achieve our results. Which is why intellectual property law, namely, let's say patent law, is so evil. Is because we have two central components of human society prospering and living together in in a growing, expanding society. One is our ability to control the universe, and the other is our knowledge of what we need to do. And we need property rights for the first because these are scarce. Rivalrous resources, right? That's why we have property rights. That's why we have law. That's why we have conflict and fighting among people, and law and property rights are meant to temper that and give us some security and the ability to employ these resources, which we need to use because our bodies aren't enough, and even our bodies are scarce resources. But on the other hand, the body of human knowledge can keep expanding without limit, and to impose property rights on something that's non-scarce. In other words, <clears throat> knowledge that we have that could be duplicated by billions or trillions or quadrillions of whatever of people at the same time in a future world is a good thing. To try to impose scarcity, which is what IP law tries to do. So. IP law, property law deals with the fact that we have scarcity in the real world, in the physical, tangible world. This is the way our universe works. Given this scarcity, we have to have property rights to help us manage it and to use it 
the most efficient way possible. That's all fine. But then what IP law does is it tries to duplicate this realm with using the force of law in the abstract or intellectual or informational realm where there is no scarcity. So they're actually trying to impose scarcity on things that are not scarce just to make it manageable by their existing systems. But what they're doing is they're hampering the second half of the key ingredient of human prosperity and flourishing, which is the pro proliferation and spread and use of knowledge. So anything that prevents the spread of knowledge and learning and competition on the free market, which is what patent and copyright law do, is completely anti-life, evil, and horrible. This is why I'm so passionate about it. I mean, I really think that we would be living in a Jetsons age at this point, um, and maybe we will be in the future, but we, we shouldn't retard it by imposing artificial restrictions on the development of knowledge that the human race needs to make us great and powerful and prosperous. That's beautiful. That's perfect. I mean, that, and it makes total sense. The, you know, look at the medical industry and you look at just a very real example with, you know, the testing for the coronavirus. CDC centralizes that to one point of success or one point of failure instead of letting the 20 labs co co collaborate, coordinate, you know, do their own thing. And, and that would have been 20 points of success or failure as opposed to one. You know, that that is just one recent illustration, I think, of the 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 dam that is often put in place, you know, for for whose protection, for whose benefit, you know, usually very deep pockets. But really just I don't know what it, what is it? Is it just for the the conquest of the ability to have power over an idea the 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 ability to protect an economic position? What is what if what you just explained is so rational logical and makes so much sense why don't we do it i don't i i i i've struggled with finding a way to explain what went wrong um my theory is that we went wrong with with Locke. and i don't blame Locke, and i understand why Locke became popular but basically the labor theory – like it's, it's basically the imprecise use of – well, it's lack of consistency in principle. But in, in this particular case, it's, it's the labor theory of value or property. So Locke, John Locke, who is seen as and thought of by us as our hero um, – he was trying to fight the power of the state, which was a monarchical thing, which rested upon this myth of that God had given earth to the monarchs, uh, you know, by the Adam and Eve story, like to simplify, right? So he was trying to come up with some defense against that serfdom mentality, this hierarchical statist mentality, right. And so what he said was, well, let's take for granted the, the Adam and Eve story and the Old Testament and the Bible because you had to at that time. So God gave the earth to Adam Adam was the first prince of the earth. Procreation happened after that, after God committed genocide in the flood, of course, which no one notices. Uh, I don't know why people don't re recognize God as like some mortal enemy of humanity because he's he's a mortal threat. He's He's like an existential threat to humanity, right? He's threatening to kill everyone if they don't I – mean, he actually did kill everyone except for like nine people or whatever in the flood. Um, anyway, but the idea is that – so but 
God gave everyone ownership of themselves, whatever that means, which wasn't, by the way, full ownership because God still owns you. Like so, so the idea was like let's let's assume God is the creator and God owns everyone. So God owns you. So you're you're God's slave. But we're going to assume God is benevolent, so He's not going to subjugate you. Although He might because He killed everyone in the flood. But Locke was trying to come up with a way to fight the monarchical powers to limit them, to say that they're not absolute. Uh, you know, they don't have absolute power. So it's like God gave everyone ownership of themselves, and he gave ownership of the whole world to Adam, but it wasn't used yet, so it was in commons, blah, blah, blah. So therefore, if you mix your labor with it, then you can own it, and then you're independent of the power of the sovereign, and etc. So it was a sort of a decentralist argument, but – he had to come up with this labor theory idea like, oh, well, you own yourself because God gave you ownership for yourself. So you own your labor. Therefore, you own what you mix it with. <coughs> so you result in this kind of kludge hodgepodge of ideas. So I think that's – I think the mis – I honestly think the big mistake we made was the locking idea of labor theory of property, which I do think – ended up resulting in the labor theory of value of Karl Marx and Ricardo and communism, right? And it resulted in the intellectual property ideas that we have now. So when you start thinking of property as the result of your labor, then, then you get this whole confusion about, well, I mean, think about the physics idea. <clears throat> in physics, what's work? Work is force over a distance or something like that right that's one definition so if you if i push on a wall and i don't move it i didn't do any work right but i still expended my labor like sweating sweat and you'll see this in patent law and copyright law the sweat of the brow it's called the sweat of the brow doctrine if you sweat it means if you labor if i spend money developing a map that shows the the streets of you know some county in New York then I should have a property right in that it's almost this protestant work ethic idea like if you spend your time doing effort then you have a property right in it like there's so many confused ideas it's almost like the communist idea like oh well okay just pay these guys a dollar a day with to use a spoon to dig a trench they're doing work you know so the labor theory of value the labor theory of property all in a sense meld together and i don't blame john locke or his followers but i do believe that was the main intellectual mistake that we've made in the western system is that we accepted this labor concept like if i could be a dictator i might just outlaw the whole word labor <laughs> even the word value to be honest i mean they it, it, it's confused economics and political theory for so long um so the only way to untangle it is to stop and think why do we have law what's the purpose of all this what's the source of value what does value mean is it a verb is it a noun I mean, I'm more Misesian. I value something by demonstrating my preference towards it, by acting to achieve it. But there's not a value in the thing, which is what the Randians say, like when they support uh, IP. They'll say uh, the source of property rights is creation of value. Like what does that mean? You don't create a value. There is no such thing as a value. Right. There it's more about that, what, what is someone willing to pay for it? Yeah, it's a verb, not a noun. It's like I value this because I demonstrate that I value it because I'm acting to to achieve it. But but to say a thing is a value or has a value is to sort of adopt this intrinsic primitive view of economics that things have intrinsic or objective values. Nothing has an objective value. 
Well, so, you know, I want to be respectful of your time. We're already 30 minutes over and, but I've, I've loved this. It's been uh, a phenomenal conversation. Um, where can people find more of your work if they want to follow you? If they, I know you said you had a podcast, uh, what podcast are you on? How can people follow your work and get more of the information that you presented? Well, so I don't really have, I don't have a real podcast. I just have an RSS feed, which collects things like this. Um, but I have a website, stephanconsello.com, and I I do have a collection of articles uh, over the years, which basically outline the things we've talked about today, um, which I'm uh, editing into a, a book, which will be out in probably, two, I would guess, two months. Um, and it's called Law in a Libertarian World. And you can find it at stephankinsella.com slash LLW, Law and Libertarian World. So that's what I'm working on right now. Very good. I'd love to have you back and talk more about that and uh, and cover that. Because I think that's that's one thing that I've been thinking a lot about lately is that people often think that, oh, if there's no government, there will be no law. There will be no mitigation of problems. There will be no – it'll just be Somalia. And that's just not the case. There, there are, there is arbitration. There is a way to settle things, and how that would operate is is definitely of interest to me and to our audience. So, love to have you back, and love to converse about that. And I will put all of this stuff in the show notes so you can follow everything. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right. Thank you for listening to We Are Libertarians, and we will talk to you very soon. Thank you. <laughs>